Thank you very much, Anna. Um, so maybe I should just say what we're going to do now. I'm going to um, show a few slides of projects that um, I've worked on. I can't offer solutions for Anna's digital storytelling problems. But um, maybe by looking at a few examples of artists that I've worked with, we can look at different types of storytelling. So I've tried to select um, artists to work in an intermediate way and to also speak in the issues they seek out to some of the problems that Anna just talked about. So um, some of the projects work with scientists, some of them work within a scientific context. So we come look at the question of interdisciplinarity. There are also examples of uh, working in the field, so our field-based curiosity can come in here. Um, and then the two terms that um, Anna mentioned of the Indu structures and Impera structures also come, come into play in the examples which I'm going to show. Um, and uh, I'll start us off here. Yes. There we are. Um, so, artist Marcus Coates, he's worked a lot on extinction, so I thought I'd pick an example of extinction because it relates so closely, particularly to these two examples of bodies of work he's created of human-animal relationships. And, um, and here he, he tries to develop empathy, which is something that Anna talked about, empathy. How can we have empathy with other species? And particularly also, how can we relate what we abstract about a species to something specific. So I'm just going to read a very short story. It's not a subtle story. So um, that's normally um, a story that goes shown with this small piece of sculpture. So he writes, uh, Marcus Coase writes, standing about 85 centimeters tall with a width of approximately 27 centimeters, the flightless great oak was the largest of the Alcott family includes guillemots, puffins, and razorbills. It had a black head, beak, wings, and back, and a white belly. A single egg was laid on bare ground. The egg averaged 12.4 centimeters in length and 7.6 centimeters across at the widest point. The egg was yellowish white to light ochre. And then he quotes from a book by Richard Ellis, No Turning Back, The Life and Death of Animal Species, and writes, the last pair, great orcs, found incubating an egg, was killed there, Eldie Island, Iceland, 3rd of July, 1844, with John Branson and Sigurd Eslefsson strangling the adults and Kettle Kettleson smashing the egg with his boot. So the artist writes, to generalize a species or abstract it is to ignore the individual without seeing the individual the human struggles to find empathy, thus creating a separation and a relationship of little or no consequence. So this is one piece of sculpture, and now um, I did a few years ago. He still works on great, the Great Orc. He just spent some time in Newfoundland to um, develop an apology to the Great Orc. Um, and now something completely different, um, which he's just developed. Again, uh, the relation between human bodies. So you'll all be familiar with this game of you form with your hands uh, a shadow um, that makes creates a shadow against the wall. And so he created a number of these um, plaster sculptures to refer to absent animals. So this is um, the Labrador duck, which is one of the said to be one of the first North American endemic uh, bird species that got extinct after European settlers arrived. Um, this is the Irish elk, which got a sting under, supposedly under the weight of its own antlers, which overgrow the body size of, of the animal. And then um, the, um, the worm <laughs> of, the, uh, um, of um, endemic to um, Tasmania, which got extinct. Well, it had only ever been found once in the 1970s. And there's a lot of hydroelectric generation going on in this area. And there was a search for the worm in the 1990s, and they couldn't find a single one, so it's presumed extinct. So this is one sort of body of works I want to show you. Um, next one is a, um, it's a bit more complicated, this project. So I, I will just see if I can encapsulate this very quickly. Um, so 
on the left-hand side, you see an image by an ecologist. I wanted to show how we are always within the situation, we are always within the field, and what you see if you're within the field. So here, um, the ecologist, early 20th century, um, holds up this piece of paper in order to highlight something, but we always have to see the interconnection with this, what is going on around it, and that's a difficulty, but also it's the, our embeddedness within the natural environment that makes it difficult to step back from it. And on the right-hand side, you see artist Christa Lebage, he's a photographer, and um, we found at the Natural History Museum in London a collection of historic ecological photographs, and um, she tried to find ways of how to reveal the historic um, knowledge and data which is in archives. So in fact, it's something that became quite interesting. How do we unlock existing archives? Instead of for, trying to look forward or to just be in the present, how can we gather the information that we already have in order to see, this, to see the evidence in the present and possibly predict it for the future. So you can see here um, Christelle, you can see the arm on the right hand side by Kath, who's a botanist who did a lot of field work with Christelle in order to retrace some of the images that they found in the archive. Um, and um, next slide. So, and as a, as a principle of, of montaging these different bits of information together. that come from different disciplines. Photographer working with botanist, working with the historic protagonist of early ecology. Um, how can you collate this information? So, sorry about the poor slide, but you can have information there about the habitat she worked in, from, drawn from different sources on the right-hand side, maps, historic photograph, her retracing in the contemporary photograph. Um, Next slide. Um, here, I just want a quick example of the uh, what Anna called the impera structures. Um, so this is by an Australian artist, um, indigenous Australian artist, who thinks about the ownership of land. So ownership of land is a really important question when you consider um, systems. Um, and he particularly looks at um, his own continent, Australia, which was invaded by the Europeans in 1788. And so his description, we call them pirates out here, is to deliberately turn perspective. Um, and he does so con by, um, next slide, um, by doing comparative analysis. So he obviously is this key moment of European settlers um, Cook arriving on the shore of Botany Bay, so which is a modern day Sydney, and how that on the right hand side was imagined later on in 1902, and how he then imagined this as a contemporary Aboriginal Australian um, later on in 2006. Um, <clears throat> and um, finally, one example which, um, if you go to the Natural History Museum in Berlin, is by Elizabeth Price. Um, and this exemplifies how you can take a species and you can take it as a lens through which you can um, unravel economic, social, political histories, like the examples that you've shown us, but here through um, this particular form which she found, and again, it's sort of intermediate. So this is a, a research image, so there's this event in the archive. She discovers those, these bones of a, of a, of a whale, it's a bowhead whale, or Grönland Wall. Um, next slide. Um, and um, and traced where the whale uh, bones came from, how they were acquired in the museum, revealing the economic networks, diplomatic networks the, nat the Natural History Museum had at the time, late 19th century, why whales were uh, collected at the time because it was noticed, because of the industrial hunting of the animals, they were going extinct, so therefore people drew attention to it. It was worthy then to put, be put into a natural history museum. Um, now still the whales are an icon of, of um, contemporary as well as historic environmentalism. Um, and then this, the, the whale hall, um, which was set up in the 1930s, was then bombed in uh, February 1945, which you can see on the, on the right hand side. With this, um, with this lifeless uh, remnants of the whale floating in the rubble. And I think this is my last slide coming up, no. Um, so yes, yeah, so again, the intermediate aspects of his storytelling. So she uh, wrote a piece of prose essentially to go within the installation at the, at the Natural History Museum, images and, and the stories that she, that she imagines how 
humans lived with creatures from the sea, how they shaped themselves by exploiting um, the baleens, the bones, um, the oils for light and so on. And uh, final slide. And this is the invitation to the viewer of to sit down in the um, installation space, in the gallery space, to pick up a story, to pick up this booklet and to read the story. And at the same time to look out through this particular window in the um, gallery space to imagine um, the whale hall, because this is the, now this is the courtyard you can see there where the whale hall used to be. So it's drawing attention and to observe the environments. And she, she correlates um, geological formations below the museum with those of the natural evolution of not just the whale, but also humans. Yeah. So maybe I'll leave you with the final image, the true forest, and we can talk. So, so now we're going to chat for about 20 minutes or so, and then we can ask lots of questions. Um, it was... Um, Actually, I didn't anticipate this, because when you talked, and you particularly talked about the, uh, the blueberries in Ukraine, I didn't expect there would be so much laughter about it, <laughs> at human ingenuity. I think that was quite interesting, actually, because you know we talk so much about the human infrastructures, and it, and it kind of connected to one of the questions I, I had for you of what makes a terrible story? To whom is it terrible? Who benefits from it, and who who loses? Who loses? Out? It's, it's a very difficult question, I think. You know, but yes. it's it's very it's because. Um, you know, you mentioned boom towns in Ukraine. People make a living after the terrible disaster, at the same time spreading a reductivity around the planet. What is terrible? I, I think uh, 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 what biologists working in Chernobyl have found, we'll just start with the small birds that have a short lives, is that not only they're only a few species, but those mm. that there are have uh, less than half the lifespan of other birds of their species elsewhere. So mm. uh, because you can see how quickly tumors develop in them, that this radioactivity is not good for people's lives. Mm. And I'm uh, going to guess that's also true with the humans, uh, even though it's easier to see it in birds because they have such short lives. Mm. I think uh, one of uh, Kate Brown's stories about humans from that area, which just has had a huge impression on me, was uh, visiting a family uh, where all the children except one have very bad uh, cancers, mm. and the one who doesn't, and the family said he only ate junk food. Mm. He only bought processed junk food. He wouldn't eat regular food, mm. and so that's the one kid who's not dying at this point in their family. So I think I, some of the features of what I'm calling terrible stories are that they cascade mm. from one form of life to another, and that the kinds of interconnections among species that have made livability possible for humans and our companions, uh, they, that it ricochets back and forth. And radioactivity is a wonderful example of something that just doesn't stay in a single species, mm. but moves across species. I mean, in the same way, in the plastic bag example, mm. that point in there was we're all eating plastic. Uh, if our animals are eating plastic, we're eating plastics too. Mm. Yes, not just uh, through milk, dairy cows in India, but uh, in plastic right. bottles and the water that we drink and, right. and so on and so on. Yeah. Yeah. How, how, and I'm just also looking at the examples of representation now, and you have the, the, the images are quite mute, aren't they? I mean, if you just present something, you need to work a lot at images. Don't, I mean, I found that when, you know, just see some of these examples, it all benefits from knowing species, histories, looking uh, into different disciplines, sourcing lots of different information. That's, how do you, how do you think that's going to, that's, and there's so many different ways of doing it. How do you think that would work in the digital storytelling? That's one question, but also you've collected so many stories. How do they come to you, these stories? Well, let me start with the representation, because I think I really loved the images that you showed. And to think about 
making an extinct animal with your hand is uh, both a kind of tribute to the animal and a moment of incredible sadness in a way that yes. only our, that all that's left is the human hand uh, and its ability to pretend to mm. be these animals, but the animal itself, the inspiration for mm. it, is it's gone. The yes. yes. Mm. So I, I, if I found it very effective mm. as a way of talking about what we lose when a species gone extinct that we can, I mean, as the Yongu uh, artist was saying, you know, we can still dance for the guana, that's that lizard that you saw in the painting, mm. uh, that we can dance for the guana, but the guana is gone because uh, the cane toads have poisoned them. Um, and what that points out to me is how important the, you know, I think I stressed uh, the part that has to do with scientists and humanists in the large sense that includes social scientists, but that that artists or people who think about representation are really at the center of this too. Mm. Uh, it seems to me that uh, that um, the challenge of the Anthropocene in general is how are you going to tell these stories in an effective way that might mean that the kind of witnessing that we're doing makes a difference. So there's many different answers to that question, mm. but uh, it's it's impossible to study the Anthropocene and not think about it. So e so anything from modeling and big data on the one hand to these little poignant kinds of stories are ways of trying to make uh, representations that matter. Mm. It's very interesting with the, the great org. I was struck by Marcus Coates's. Um, divergence of approaches, you know, of the very abstract sculpture of, you yes. know, this is a, is a great abstraction of species, the way we understand the term species. So we measure it out, we taxonomize it and so on. And then the, the uh, relating the stories of the extinction. But what I find quite striking is with um, a, a lot of artists who get in, into these subject areas is they, they work for a long time on certain ideas. And so does he, so he, as I just mentioned, he's been to Newfoundland mm -hmm. and he works with the community there where are still types of orcs, so the razorbill orcs, for example. And um, and with Marcus Coates, it always strikes me that he's got a very particular humor, which, as I found in your <laughs> talk as well just now. Um, and so he works with the community there, and they're trying to figure out um, an apology, an apology on behalf of their ancestors, of the settler community there in the 19th century, and they're trying to figure out what is the wording of this apology to the great orc who's mm -hmm. gone extinct. Mm -hmm. So it wow. became a really interesting um, work. He filmed it, yes. and so they formulated um, an apology. And they sort of, well, an apology is important because we need to sort of think forward. We need to mm -hmm. not want this to happen again, and we, we like to, we need to think about it. We sort of, it was a cohabitation with species that they were really expressing through this apology. Mm -hmm. And then you had the, um, the mayor of this small settlement the megaphone, shouting it out into the onto the uh, oh, wow. onto the. <laughs> That's really interesting. <laughs> yes, I just, <laughs> so I just I just love it from you know an abstraction to, to this terrible story of the kill. So that's why I put it in because I think it's a terrible mm -hmm. story of of violence mm -hmm. towards a species, human towards a species, um, towards um, making it with your hands, being that species that gone extinct to expressing something in words. And then being right. in the environment as well, in right. which you, you, you express that apology and that sorrow, mm -hmm. um, which I think these are all really interesting ideas um, that I think possibly could sort of come into the storytelling, mm -hmm. digital mm -hmm. or other, around mm -hmm. um, the ex explication of the, uh, the evidencing of, uh, of, the, of these stories and you know, what you would do with it in the future. So if you collect those stories, you do having a sort of forensic perspective onto environments, I guess, but then what do you do with them for the, for the future? How will it activate? Well, I th think that's where the digital architecture, which is very much in process and very much not yet a product, comes mm -hmm. in, that we want to present them in a way, I mean, that's charismatic, that people will use them, that the dream for this feral atlas is that 
It's a teaching tool. It's a research tool in the sense of sparking a kind of research imagination that's at that intersection point where human histories and non-human histories come together. And that it's also kind of fun mm. to play with. So we were hoping to pull in audiences across that axis um, to think about these feralities. And as I said, to look at the cases that we didn't have. Mm. And actually, let me address the question of where these cases come from. Mm. And yes. of course, uh, it, it's, uh, they, we don't just find them on the street, that we are trying to convince scientists and uh, humanists and artists that we know to participate uh, in this project. And uh, as you heard, it's people who've done some primary research on these phenomena, so we're trying not to make this a kind of simple journalism where you've just read an article and you want to write about it, but when possible, uh, to have somebody who can talk about the procedures through which they learned about these problems. And I'm saying this because we got this nice big audience here, and if any of you, uh, whatever your walk of life, have things that might fit, we still, you know, there are still really important stories that we haven't put in here, so please write me if you think you've got one from your own research, whatever meaning of research uh, you have. So I can't promise you we'll include it, but I would really like to hear from you if you got one, because I think there's tons of stories we haven't gotten to yet. Mm. What, what I was interested in when you talked about the plantation scene, and yes. you had to show the image of the plantation, and you had the weevil, and then you also had the um, person who was enslaved or forced labor in it. I was just wondering, um, because humans have treated humans very badly, and I think it, I think often it gets forgotten in the Anthropocene discourses of how the what the effects were on on humans and and, and, and enslavement in particular. Um, do you do you think it should figure more strongly, or I mean the human human aspect is I mean it is somewhere in there, but you concentrating mostly on non-human species so far. In, in well, we're really trying to entangle. Mm the human and non-human features of it. But of course, stressing, I, I, this is not about the kind of will to kill pe aspect of human whatever, but rather these infrastructures. But there's plenty of places where uh, the mistreatment of humans and the mistreatment of non-humans go together. And in fact, we're considering uh, about the boll weevil using uh, famous kind of folk song in, of American, written by an American blues singer, Lead Belly, uh, back during the period when the boll weevil was uh, hitting those uh, fields and African Americans as a result were forced to migrate mm -hmm. uh, because the cotton was going broke they were forced to migrate to the north, so it had huge sociological mm -hmm. effects. Um, and the thing about Lead Belly's song, which I'm just tempted to put the song on there, is that it's clear that Lead Belly uh, himself identifies with the boll weevil. The, the, the song personifies the boll weevil. It says he was looking for a home. That's the boll weevil, he was looking for a home. And uh, it ends with Lead Belly, who's part of this migration to the north, he was looking for a home, he was looking for a home. So there was a sense where the identification of humans and these feral creatures mm -hmm. Uh, was a, an important part of that. We've got an entry from an anthropologist who worked uh, with scavengers in Kampala, the capital city of Uganda, on who worked in waste dumps uh, collecting stuff. And and there, it's it's you know one of the examples where it isn't a terrible story, but a kind of good story where uh, exotic species, marabou storks, have gathered on these. Uh, waste dumps to eat all the organic materials, and the scavengers actually really like the um, the storks because they get rid of a lot of the organic garbage and allow the scavengers to look for the stuff they really want, which is the durable materials that they're going to find in this waste dump. So uh, the city authorities want to get rid of both the marabou storks and the garbage pickers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he writes about the identification they have for each other as different kinds of scavengers on this stump. So that would be another example. Mm. I'd love to ask you lots more questions, but maybe the audience has got mm -hmm. some, some questions at this point. 